is a bunch of things. This class has a bunch of ideas that I had sort of all boiled down into me trying to do a less than four hour class on this. Um, essentially what I want to enable folks to do is to be able to look at artwork and go, oh, this is what I'm seeing in the artwork. This is what this means as far as garb creation um, and clothing creation and costuming. Um, I tend to think of all this as costuming because that's what I do. So this is sort of my, why should you trust a word that I say? Um, mundanely, I am a theater costumer. So I spend all of my time looking at artwork from people. I'm a costume technology person. So I spend all my time looking at artwork from a designer and going, all right, but what do you mean by that? What, what do you actually want that to look like live? Um, so because of that, I'm now especially good at looking at art and going, I bet this is what you mean by that line. Um, so this entire class is basically me trying to figure out how to share some of that skill with you. Sadly, one of the things you'll hear me say a lot is you have to do it a lot to learn this. Um, keep looking at things, keep discovering things, keep poking around at things, but hopefully this will get you closer to that faster than if you had to sort of discover it all on your own. Um, I figured I should start teaching this class or I should figure out how to teach this class when I kept talking to people and they just didn't see things. And I was like, but how do you not see things? It's right there and people didn't see things. Um, and actually going online for this makes a lot of sense because it is so image heavy. And so you'll see like, as we get into the slideshow and so forth, there's just a lot to see that would be harder to do sort of in a normal SEA context, it's like sitting, sitting in, you know, out in the back 50 in a field somewhere without, you know, 80,000 books or like an entire computer, computer setup. Um, so with that sort of disclaimer introduction, um, feel free to jump in and like type in questions if you have them as I go. Um, at the end, I'll give you the Google Drive link to sort of the handout that I've been using. I can try to throw the or the, the sort of outline handout that I've got that I'm working from. Um, I can probably also throw the PowerPoint up there too if you want the images. Um, but feel free to like jump in and like write out questions as we go. Uh, I'm going to try to do this not at the speed that my students refer to as excitable Muppet but sometimes I get going and if I do get going too fast, feel free to just like throw a hand up and be like, whoa, 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 slow down. Um, all right, see if my PowerPoint will happen. All right, so what am I looking at as I start looking at art? Um, one of the first things that I look at as I start looking at art as far as costume construction goes is I start looking at silhouette. So, do I see the outline of the body? Is it more blousey? Um, one of the first dead giveaways for what period you're looking at is gonna be silhouette. So the earlier in time something is, the earlier in our period or our SCA period something is, um, the more likely it is to be rectangular construction. So it's basically made of squares and triangles. Um, rectangular construction is common, especially early on because it's the most efficient way to use fabric. Um, later on, uh, oh, Facebook Live is being a problem. Bummer. Uh, later on, rectangular construction becomes underwear. So the rectangular shapes that you see the Norse wearing later sort of evolve into being to like Tudor underwear. Um, Pre-1300, a lot of things, pretty much most things, especially Western Europe, um, is going to be, whoop, uh, whoop, 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 there we go. I keep thinking I can scroll and I can't. Um, Pre-1300, most everything is going to be pretty much rectangular construction. Post-1300, we start seeing a lot more of the body. So in the examples I've got here, if I can, um, I wish I could point to them easier, but in the, the Bible from France, I'm not even going to try to say it. I'm not going to try to say that name. I'm sorry. 
for all the polls out there. Um, but you can see that a lot of that is just sort of big and voluminous and there's not much shape to it except for like maybe a belt around the middle compared to our portrait of a young lady where you can see a lot more of the shape of her upper body and you can see sort of where the skirt comes in to gathers. Um, so that's, those are going to be more complex construction techniques and more complex uh, like cutting pattern shapes than the rectangular. So you can see sort of the difference, the difference in there. Um, if you think again of like even later than our, our lady there, sort of pumpkin hose, um, you can get into st stuff that shapes the silhouette of the body. So stuff that instead of just seeing a body, you start seeing body plus something. Um, or you can look at you know, if I know this is a lady body and all of a sudden she's more conical, something is shaping her. You can tell that there's something in the garment that's doing that. Um, so those are going to be later, rectangular kind of blouse is usually going to be earlier. Of course, there are always some things that kind of like split the difference and they get a little weird. We'll get into that a little later. later. Um, a lot of learning silhouettes in period is staring at them for a while. So if you're interested in a specific era, if you're like, I want, you know, Germany in 1450, um, as you start finding things that are accurate to Germany in 1450, you'll start seeing and start sort of remembering what that silhouette looks like. And you'll be able to tell a lot easier when you're sort of faced with something that's not right. Like, oh, that doesn't look like what I've been seeing. What's going on here? Um, one of the other things I look for, let's see if I can click through, there we go, um, is fabric behavior and sort of what I call fabric continuity. Um, is fabric stiff or drapey or loose or showing strain or like what is it doing that tells me sort of how it might be put together. Um, as the art gets more detailed and and mediums in art change, this becomes a lot more helpful. Um, so there are some images that we'll see later on in the slideshow where it's basically a Norse garment and it sort of just looks like a triangle sticking straight out from the waist. The carver who did that sort of stone carving obviously knows like that is the shape of the garment lying flat down but can't quite figure out how to do like oh but this falls to the body. Um, so in a way those are great because you can see like this triangle is the shape of the garment in a way it doesn't help you as much because if you take that at face value you're like oh i'm gonna do this thing that sticks straight out and people are gonna be like what are you what are you doing um shadows and shading in the art can tell you a lot they can tell you a lot about sort of pleats and where excess fabric is and so forth in garments so if you look at the uh the Arnolfini close-up here, the lady in green, you can see that she has that series of sort of like rolly, tucky pleats in the center there. That implies to me that there is extra fabric there, um, that she's basically put the belt on to sort of hold all that in. So if you were to take that belt off, that garment would probably be willing to sort of spread out and become bigger. This is also the same as what you see in the men of the Magi there, um, where these are hooplons, and hooplons are basically conspicuous consumption. How much fabric can I wear? So the amount of fabric sort of in these pleats, you can see by sort of the number and the depth of the pleats. So you know that that's going to be a lot of fabric sort of gathered down into a belt or something like that to control it. Um, the fact that we can see on both the Magi and the Arnolfini as well that the pleats or the like sort of the tucks seem to pass behind the belt um, also implies that there's probably not a seam there, that this is one big piece of fabric. Because usually if you have if you have more fabric than you need and you gather it down and you'll gather it down from the top and then you'll gather it down from the bottom and you'll sew them together that usually your pleats won't line up as nicely unless you're really, really, really working on it. Is there a chance that there is a seam in there and they did just spend the time to really, really, really work on it? Yes, uh, but that seems much less likely than that it's just a lot of fabric and we belted it in. I think that's, is that, that's not Godwin's law. Someone's law is, you know, if it's, if it's too complex, it's probably not how they did it. That's a truism in a lot of costuming and a lot of sewing sort of things. Um, 
Similarly to this, so if men are wearing tights that are so, or are wearing hose or pants that are so tight they look painted on, there's a good chance that's telling you something about the fabric. Um, fabric that is so tight that it is like body form is usually stretchy somehow, since knits weren't really a thing in this period. Generally, those things that needed to be stretchy, like hose, would be cut on the bias. So instead of sort of straight up and down, they would be cut on sort of a 45 degree angle from the warp or the weft of the fabric where it's stretchiest. Um, another thing I ask myself sort of about fabric as we go is, do I know what fabrics are common in this time period? Can I see sort of what I'm looking at? Um, you can see in the Arnolfini portrait, that is likely a wool, a green wool, um, and that fuzzy white stuff is all fur. Um, I believe it's the Tudor Taylor ladies, I think it was Ninja Michaela who actually recreated this as part of a BBC series. Theirs is fully lined in fur. It does those like perfect like rolled tucks. So the fur is part of what's doing that. Um, so figuring out what your fabrics are, where they are, how they're used can help in figuring out how to get your garment to look sort of more right. Um, and that like learning how people, learning how artists depict fibers is another one of those like so you have to stare at it for a while sort of things. Um, let's see get to my next slide. There we go. Um, another thing I'm looking for is seam lines or closures, if there are any apparent in the art. Um, sometimes artists are so detailed, a lot of time in the portraits, that they'll paint in seam lines or show you like a shadow in the fabric. Uh, on the Petrus Christus, the legend of Saint, I can't see his name, it's behind stuff, the legend of Saint Elgius, um, on the men, especially sort of around their shoulder, you can see how the fabric comes in and there's a shadow, which is telling you like that's where a seam is. Um, again, you can see some of the sort of rolled, rolled pleating in there. I think I'm getting a question. Let me grab that. Ah, yeah, the Stitches in Time series are the, is the, 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 um, Arnolfini where they remake that. It's a, it's a series worth finding if you can find it. Um, but you can see on the men, like the seams in here, uh, you can see on Mine Agnes by Durer, uh, this is just a line drawing by Durer, but you can see his, like the seam under her arm, and you can see that like that seam comes down into a waist seam that sort of cuts her horizontally, and then you can see her closure sort of up in front. Um, Marguerite, if you're not if you don't know what you're looking at, sometimes you'll miss this. Most of these German dresses close somehow in the front and most of the time will overlap. That white line you can see sort of running down behind her arms from the gold sort of chest plate um, is probably fur. And that's actually the lining of that blue dress. So you can see that she would have sort of laced down the front and then that's probably open or hooked just sort of over to one side a little bit. Um, so looking for like, what are my seam lines? What are my closures? Um, similarly, on the on the woman in the uh, Petrus Christus, you can see her lacing down her front as well. So looking for things like that. Um, go back to my notes. Make sure I'm not losing anything. Uh, if you don't see any seam lines closures are what I generally look for because closures a lot of times will indicate, um, such as in the portrait of Marguerite, like this is how I get into it. Um, so if you have, you know, like lacing down the back, that's probably where you get into it. It would make sense that if you're, you know, like lacing down the back of a bodice, it's going to have to come into the waist, but then you're going to have to get through that waist somehow. So those two back bodice pieces are going to have to open. So putting a seam in line with those closures makes a lot of sense. And you have to remember that people back then weren't stupid. Um, they may not have, you know, all the technology and all the knowledge we have these days, but it also like, this is common sense. This is where the opening needs to be to get me into this dress. Um, closures and fastenings, do you see any closures and fastenings? Um, sometimes they're big and aggressive, so on Marguerite, it's like, here is how this is closed, down the front. Um, sometimes you'll see, you know, on earlier stuff, it'll be just a big, like, round thing, probably a brooch holding something shut there. Um, 
sometimes you can only see part of the fastenings. And one of the places that that is real common is on the German Kranich dresses, um, where you can see sort of lacings down the torso, but that's it. Um, and there have been a lot of people who have worked on like, how did those actually close? Because we're clearly trying to hold the two fronts of this dress together as we sort of lace back and forth, but like what all, what all goes along with that? Um, so that's where starting to cross-reference, I can see this closure, what else can I find on this closure can be helpful. Um, whether that's cross-referencing uh, archaeological finds, so going and looking in, you know, Germany, like what were we finding? Were we finding lacing rings? Were we finding hooks? Was everything eyelets? Um, or you can go to other reenactors, which a lot of times is helpful. I'll even go to reenactors to be like, what were other people, what are other people thinking about this? Like, if I think it's lacing rings, am I completely off base or are other people thinking that too? Um, using the hive mind a lot of times can help you sort of not reinvent the wheel on things. Um, if you can see closures, like I was saying, generally you can figure out what they are. Um, short lines sort of horizontally down the front of especially women's garments a lot of times are lacing. Uh, they're spiral lacing. You'll see a couple examples of that in a few slides. So many pictures, so few slides. Um, you'll, see, you'll see examples of sort of horizontal lacing. Um, there are if there are tiny like metallic looking flecks near a seam that you can see, a lot of times, especially in Tudor and Elizabethan, that's gonna be pinheads. Um, you can sometimes see like dots where there are lacings. Uh, on men's, uh, men's garments, especially as we start getting into hose and jerkins together, if you've got like floofy ribbony things sort of at the waistline or near the waistline, that a lot of times will be points where they're sort of tied to hold everything up together. Um, again, I'm going to say this a lot, the more you know about, the more you know about it already, the more obvious stuff like this becomes. So a lot of this is just immerse yourself in it. Become a giant nerd. Um, closures and so forth are also helpful in figuring out sort of your time period, or at least sort of locking, not locking you down, but sort of bringing you down to a time period. If your Norse garment seems to have hooks on it, probably not actually Norse. Um, similarly, if your Tudor garment seems to be held together by like a series of brooches, again, a little questionable. So like I said, it's about starting to know sort of what you should be seeing and then cross-referencing it with what you are seeing. Um, which brings us to my next slide, uh, accuracy of what you're seeing to existing or known patterns or garments. So one of the questions that I'll ask myself is, have I seen a pattern breakdown of a garment of this time period before? And does what I'm seeing seem to agree with this? Um, so this is a great sort of research place. So if you see something and you're like, I have to make this sort of break it down and see if you can find something similar from the same era, from the same location. Um, so if I'm looking at, you know, like a Tudor or later garment, I'm probably going to check in with Janet Arnold. Um, I'm going to check in, you know, with a couple of the Victorian Albert Museum books that I've got. Um, if I don't have anything that seems real obvious, I might check out sort of some of the how to make your own pattern books um, and see sort of what people are saying about that. So like the Tudor Taylor ladies have done a lot of research um, but aren't pulling their patterns from just like one specific Tudor garment the way Jan Janet Arnold is. They're saying overall sort of this was the way they were patterned. These are the shapes that you're looking at. Here's how to do it for you. Um, so I'll double check with things like that and be like, ah, you've done the research. You're telling me these are generally what I want. Do my shapes agree? Um, and sort of as a last resort, you can always look at what commercial pattern companies are saying these shapes should be. Um, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not. They may not be 100% accurate, but a lot of times they can give you, ah, this looks like it would probably have, you know, four pieces in the bodice and a big rectangular skirt. And if what you're seeing in the art is similar to that, you're probably, again, close, because no one's working in a, in a vacuum. Um, 
there are other sort of smaller history specific patterns that exist like pattern companies and I don't want to like call any of them out because some of them do real good research, but the patterns don't make up into garments very well. Um, but since they've done the research again, if you have that pattern and you can look at uh, This is the shape that they're saying this should be and I see that like in the art. You can start, you know, saying, ah, yes, I believe this is what the art is doing. Um, another question I ask, does what I'm seeing in the art agree with any live garments of this era that I've seen before? Um, my notes in this literally say, museums are the best. Uh, if, even if you can't get to a museum live, you can look at a lot of collections online these days. Um, and a lot of museums are more than willing to sell you books with parts of their garment collection in them uh, because there's a lot of demand for coffee table books of pretty clothes. Uh, so you can start seeing, you know, like what in the actual garments that we've got from this era, what am I seeing as far as construction details, as far as closures and seams and so forth. Let me check in on a question I think I've got here. Ah, uh, yes, museums are awesome. Museums are absolutely awesome. I love them. Um, the other thing you can do with museums is a lot of times the curators who are working in textiles are just as big a nerd as you are and they want to get the information out there. Email the curator and say, hey, do you have any additional pictures of this thing that I'm looking at? I'm specifically trying to figure out, you know, like, how did it close or how did it, where were the seams or like, what was the trim or anything like that? And a lot of times curators will be like, oh my gosh, it's another nerd. Absolutely. Here's all the information you've ever wanted. Um, let's see, next slide. Um, something to look at, do others of this thing exist? Um, and we'll kind of come back to this one again as well. Um, so does what I'm seeing in the art that I'm looking at agree with other art from this time period or this location? Um, so this, this trek can be as detailed and time consuming or as undetailed and quick as you want. Essentially, can you find what you think you're seeing in one piece of art and then another piece of art? If yes, you've probably found a pretty reasonable depiction of a garment. If you can only find one or very few, there are a couple of different reasons you could have that. Um, so for an example, I just threw up my like ladies in black with puffy sleeves. Um, these are mostly, well, I was gonna say mostly German. Obviously we've got like the Duchess of Norfolk in there, um, but this is a very normal sort of like puff sleeve, short sleeve, black over loose robe to see in Germany. Like this also shows up in one of the Janet Arnold books. Since there are so many of them and they are so similar, we can basically look at these and be like, yeah, this probably existed in, you know, the late 1500s. This was a thing. Um, so if you can't find other versions of this, and this is sort of my um, things I've never managed to find again uh, board, um, the couple of reasons you may only be able to find one or very few of a costume piece. Um, is it depicting a saint? Uh, so over on the left, the hours of Joanna of Castile, I believe that this is a saint. I do not speak Latin enough to know uh, which saint this is. Um, yeah, fun with, fun with allegories is what we're calling this part. Um, I do not know enough to know which saint this is, but her dress is sort of three periods at once because she seems to have on a sideless surcoat, but then the layer under that seems to be a wasted coat hardy with short like rolled up sleeves. And then she's got these like giant big like blee out sleeves underneath that. Um, and then looking at her, I kind of went, what are you wearing? Because then, she, of course, she's got like tighter sleeves under those. And then I saw the halo and I was like, ah, you're not a real person. <laughs> you're wearing whatever the artist felt like putting you in. Um, similarly, the two Mary Magdalene's here uh, are from two completely different places, are wearing the same sort of like weird metallic one-eared or probably two-eared headpiece. I haven't seen this headpiece anywhere else. Um, except on Mary Magdalene's and on maybe like a couple of saints and the saints tend to have sort of like wingy, like wingy versions of this. 
could it be a folk headdress that just kind of got, you know, absorbed in? Possibly. I haven't found where it came from yet. So this to me is sort of suspect as like an apocryphal, like, this is Mary Magdalene, here is how you know it's Mary Magdalene sort of headdress. Um, you can also see on the Spanish Mary Magdalene, she again has that sort of halo, which is like, ah, this isn't a real person. Um, I also threw in the personification of philosophy because part of color coat hardies did exist, part of color people didn't. So just the fact that this person is painted that way starts to make me think like, mm, I don't know if this is an actual thing or if you're trying to make me, you know, see apocryphally something else. Um, people are saying that the Mary Magdalene's look sort of like ear irons. They do. Um, the ear irons at this point, though, were probably a much smaller version. It wasn't until like the 1800, I think, we started getting into the big ones. Um, at some point, get me started on my Elizabethan ear irons theory that like all of a sudden everyone is on board with. And I'm like, yep, think they were wearing them way earlier. Um, so depicting a saint is a one of the reasons like you may not find another version of the same garment in other art um another one is is this person being depicted by an artist not from their culture or their time period um sometimes folks seeing garments cross culturally don't don't understand what they're looking at or don't know how it all goes together um Similarly, there are a lot of later artists, and we'll get to them sort of at the end of this, that do medieval art that isn't medieval and isn't accurate. Um, the third thing that I look at is sort of, is this piece by sort of a proto-surrealist or a monk with an agenda? Um, so Hieronymus Bosch painted a lot. He painted a lot of like hellscapes and a lot of the you know, like very surreal, like melty things and like, giant birds eating naked people. Um, he probably wasn't trying to depict clothing accurately, so I'm not necessarily going to trust him as far as clothing goes. Um, similarly, you know, if you come into a hellscape drawn by a monk, um, he's more interested in scaring you away from hell than he is in depicting accurate clothing. So one of those is that's sort of a your mileage may vary. Um, Someone says, yes, Hieronymus Bosch is butt music. Always the butt music. Um, but needless to say, if other things in the painting are suspect as far as realism or accuracy go, I would not use that as a trusted source. Um, alternatively, though, if you find a garment in only a few places, but you still like have this feeling that this was a real garment, sometimes you have to change your research path. Sometimes you have to stop looking at the art uh, and you have to go to another type of documentation. I did a whole project on miniver caps, which are those sort of three-pointed white hats that everyone knows from, um, it's technically four-pointed because there's one in the back, uh, but they're the ones that everyone knows from A Knight's Tale, and people are like, that's not a real hat. Uh, that is a real hat. They don't show up in many, many portraits or many pieces of art because they were considered sort of casual hats. Uh, so why would you get your, that's like, why would you get your portrait painted in a ball cap? Um, so they were seen as undress. So they don't necessarily show up in as many portraits, but there is a lot of sort of written documentation of them. So if you have, if you just have this gut feeling that like this thing exists, that's where you have to sort of swap over and go to written documentation or to wills or something like that to try to figure out if it's actually there. Ah, keep getting ahead of myself in the in the PowerPoint. All right, so sort of second half of all of this, I've talked about a little bit about what I look for as I'm doing research and costuming and so forth. Like, what am I looking at? What am I looking for? What am I trying to get it to tell me? Um, how do I choose what art to look at? Um, and I already gave away my next slide because I got an itchy trigger finger. Sometimes this is the only art you have. Um, so when you research the Norse, what you get is runestone art a couple of Valkyrie pendants, some fragmented bits of garment, and that's about it. Um, the Oseberg tapestry, the Bayou tapestry, maybe, possibly, um, but the Norse are one of those where you're trying to sort of like fragment all the bits together. Um, and a lot of this is, if you look at like the Oseberg tapestry, it's sort of what, what between these three things can I see that 
seem the same, what am I seeing? Um, and that's essentially what the Norse the Norse researchers have done is tried to piece together like this is the bit that I have, um, this is what I see, this is where I think it all goes. Um, and there, there's a lot, obviously, there's a lot of contention. Uh, there's a lot of Norse researchers who are like, this is not that, and a lot of other Norse researchers, researchers who are like, this is definitely that. Um, but that's one of those where it's, if this is the only art you have, you got to use everything you've got and try to figure it out from there. Um, other times, we have art and an existing garment. Um, and you may have noticed that Nils Stewart, this is the third, second, second or third time Nils Stewart has shown up in this, this presentation. Um, the pattern that I gave you from Janet Arnold back on the does this match what I'm seeing in the pattern page, is Nils Stewart's actual garment. Um, so for Nils, you've got the pattern work that Janet Arnold has done, which is pretty much she's the trusted source. You've got a portrait of him wearing a very similar garment, and sadly the resolution on this portrait isn't great. Um, but as if you look sort of down around his waistline, you can see like all of the Pluterhosen puffy pant gathering. You also have clothes that were worn by him, and they know they were worn by him because he was in them when he got murdered. Um, so having, you know, portrait clothes pattern is like the amazing, like, oh, like holy trifecta of trying to get things right. Um, similarly, the family portrait from the solo over there and the Eleanor of Toledo, the lady in waiting of Eleanor of Toledo dress, same area in Italy, similar fabrics, similar shapes. So you can sort of pull the information from both of those together and go, ah, in this area in Italy at this time, this is going to be about what I'm looking at. Um, and since we have the existing garment, we have a lot of the, you know, firsthand research on, ah, this is how it would close, this is how it would be sewn together, this is you know, all the information we can get from that. Go back and check my notes and make sure, yep, I've already talked about that more than I had written down. Um, so the next art that I will generally look at is portraits, which are amazing if you get uh, trustworthy ones. Um, this is a Holbein portrait of Jane Seymour and then an Albrecht Durer self-portrait. Uh, if you can find their pre-sketches, Holbein did a, a lot of pre-sketches. Uh, you can find them a lot of times that's where you can see so on Jane on the on the pre-sketch you can see even more apparently sort of that opening down the side because he's drawn in a line and been like ah oh, her dress opens here and then went back on the portrait and like flecked in the the pinheads um uh Durer is another like really detailed portraitist um so if you can start finding the portraits where you can, you know, zoom like way in and see all the details. Those are sort of the best sources if you can get them. Uh, be careful, however, if you start seeing sort of the same portrait over and over again. Um, some are copies of the original because that was a thing that would happen. I, earlier I was talking about how the sketch that sort of started out the whole presentation in the background was a Holbein sketch that painting doesn't exist anymore, but two of Holbein's students did sort of their own versions of them. Um, so you have to be kind of careful that you're not getting sort of like the third version of the portrait where someone's just kind of like, ah, it's about here and there's some stuff here and there's some here. Um, you want to make sure sort of you know what version you've got and where, uh, where it's coming from. Uh, what are the triangle bead things on her sleeves and is trim around the neckline? I read that as a form of probably gold work netting, um, probably like couched down sort of in that, in that pattern. Um, see, uh, the other thing you have to rock, you have to, um, you have to take into account where portraits are, is that if the portrait is a very, very, very famous person, um, so like Queen Elizabeth or something like that, a lot of times they had clothes that just sort of, like they were the queen, she may have worn them once, and then they put them sort of on a stand 
and sent them to the portrait artist and said, here you go, these are the queen's clothes, here is the likeness of her face that she likes, you will paint that. Um, so the clothes on some of like the Armada portrait and so forth may actually be on someone not the queen or maybe just on a stand somewhere in an artist's studio. Uh, so a good artist will know sort of how the fabric should behave. Uh, a, you know, the artist's third assistant who is, you know, trying to figure out how art works may just sort of paint what they see. So you may get a couple of kind of bizarre, like wrinkles where it was like, oh, we flopped this over the couch so we could paint the, the, the detail on it. So figuring out how many portraits you have, which one was the first, who was the first painter um, is part of the research that you want to do when you look at, at multiple portraits like that. Um, da -da 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 -da. Ah, next slide. I'm trying to figure out where I am. Books of hours and illuminations. As you get earlier, this is a great, a great source. Um, the ones made, the books of hours and the illuminations that show up in them for really, really rich people were handwritten and hand illustrated and show religious stories generally illustrated in the clothing of the time because that's what the illustrators knew and because it's easy to show people who are different. Um, so if everyone is wearing, you know, sort of your rectangularly constructed, like, base clothing, and then suddenly someone shows up and they've got all this fancy stuff wrapped around them, you can be like, that guy's probably a saint. Um, illustrations, too, are where a lot of the non-Western cultures at this point are, are visible as well. So there are, like, some Chinese documents, there are some... I think Persian illustrations of like women in clothing. Um, and so illustrations, if you can find, especially people illustrated by folks of their own culture are kind of another great resource. On these, so on the Luttrell Psalter, these are or the Luttrell Psalter, I, language is not my thing. Um, you can see these guys are mostly uh, rectangular construction. As we get to the poems in the middle, they're a lot more fitted so you can see we're moving sort of forward in time and this is where i was talking about if you see those horizontal sort of hatched lines across a woman's front generally that spiral lacing which is why i then threw in the romance of the rose because you can see on him he is also spiral laced but he is also spiral lacing her into her dress so you can see sort of the evolution of the ability of the artist to show more kind of directly like what they what they actually meant. Um, all right, woodcuts. Woodcuts and etchings are awesome um, if you can find them, and studies are awesome if you can find them, because this is sort of art without, art without the glut, in a way. Um, yeah, there are people in the chat chiming in with some great, like, Persian stuff and Arabic and, like, all of the, the illustrations you can find. My expertise is mostly Western, which is why I kind of stuck to that, but you can definitely take sort of these principles and apply them, you know, any other non-Western place that, that you find artwork from. Um, but woodcuts, etching, studies, these are awesome because you can see sort of what the artist saw before they put layers and layers and layers of paint or something else like that on it. Um, so a lot of times on these, you can see seam lines, you can see pinheads. If you look at Margaret Giggs, you can see like the seams in the fur on her miniver cap. You can see the pins holding part of the dress down. You can see on um, the Dutch sergeant, all of the slashing, like you can go in and, and count slashes if you want. These are awesome for details if you can find the ones that that are in the right um, time period. If you're interested in Landsknecht or German, woodcuts are sort of the way to go if you can find, find exactly what you want in them. Um, another sort of weird source that people don't generally think of, statuary and effigies. Um, a lot of funeral effigies from sort of the 14th and 15th centuries are surprisingly detailed. These are some of sort of the best examples that I found. Um, a lot of these were, probably carved from the dead person's clothes, like from looking at the dead person's clothes. I know there have been effigies, if you know the effigy corset, um, that was actually put on an effigy, so sometimes effigies would be actually dressed as well. Um, I use effigies a lot in looking at veils and headwear and sort of how 
layers of clothing go together. I generally also find that effigies are more helpful for women than men because the women are in clothes and the men are usually in armor, which is great if you're looking at armor, but if you're trying to figure out men's clothes, they're, they're, that's hard shell turtle and that doesn't help as much. Uh, so for women especially, effigies can come in handy. Um, they're also great because you can get in, if you're that kind of person, you can get in and like count like how many buttons did she have down the sleeve or like how many buttons did she have down the front. So effigies, a good way to go. Um, and sort of our last art source is tapestry. Um, I honestly don't use tapestry that much, but I know I have other friends who are like, oh God, you have to talk about tapestry. One of the nice things about at least the later tapestry, so like the Devonshire hunting tapestry here, is that you can see in pretty good detail like what the fabric looked like. So the tapestry weavers or the tapestry embroiderers, depending on sort of how your how your tapestries were happening, um, could very, very accurately depict the fabric in fabric instead of having to rely on, you know, paint or brush strokes or something like that to sort of show what the details of the fabric were. They were working in fabric to show fabric, which gave them some advantage um, on showing sort of like the depth of color and the brocades and so forth and all of that. Uh, when you get earlier into like the Bayou Tapestry, less precision in showing the fabric, um, but it's a good place to look at how did the fabric behave because they put in um, like clearly like the wrinkles, they sort of like embroidered into the tapestry. Um, and you can see a lot of like, as I was talking about the big, you know, like chunky closures, you can see like they've all got brooches here. You can see that there is some sort of, you know, outline here around the neck. Um, so even early tapestries like this, you can pick up construction details, but if you're looking for like fabric details, a lot of times you want, like it's the later ones that will really give you the assistance on that. Um, any major questions before I sort of launch into the last, the last bit of this? I'm happy to like dance as people type if I need to. All right, not yet, so I'm gonna forge ahead. Um, so that was a little bit about art to trust. Now art not to trust. Don't trust a pre-Raphaelite. They're pretty, it's great, you can put them on the wall and admire them. Don't trust them for costume construction or for clothing construction. Um, so the pre-Raphaelites were painting sort of mid to late 1800s. Um, and like, they meant well. Uh, they do a lot of pseudo medieval artwork that gets referred to in costumes. Um, so like the Lady of Shalott, they did a lot of sort of in the style of paintings from sort of early in Italian, early Italian stuff, but they don't really know how the clothes work. Like they were, you know, 200 years, 300 years removed from most, if not all of it. Um, one of the easiest ways to not use a pre-Raphaelite is to look at when the painting was painted. Uh, so I've given you sort of examples of what I see when I look at pre-Raphaelite art here. Um, Hylil and Hildebrand is like famous, like every SCA person knows this one, the meeting on the turret stairs. He is kind of a mishmash of a couple of different things, like he might be Norse because he's got the leg wraps, he might be slightly later, he's got some probably like printed silk on, we might be looking at crusades, who knows? She is the shape of a Victorian lady, which is why I've given you the 1864 corset back. And you can see sort of in that jog in in the waist that she does, that is exactly what that 1864 corset is going to do. Other than that, I can't really pick on her too much. The two of them are from completely different time periods if I were to look at it, but you know, it's it's a water house. They don't really know what, or, uh, it's a Burton. They don't really know what they're doing. Um, similarly, Lady Macbeth shows up a lot because people are like, oh, like Macbeth, that was Shakespeare. He was writing about even earlier stuff. Um, this is a fun one as a costumer because this costume actually still exists. So I've given you the John Singer Sargent image of Ellen Terry as Lady Macbeth. And then that second picture is the actual costume from 1889 
But then if you look at the two of those next to the silhouette from 1889, that's an 1889 silhouette with like the smoothed in waist and the, the like tight sleeves and so forth. Um, yes, bleouts existed or bleos existed. They would have been similar to this, but that silhouette is, is still like very 1889 at this point. So if you take nothing else from sources not to use, don't trust a pre-Raphaelite. Always look up the, the date on the art that you want to use. Make sure it's in the range of what you're looking for. Or at least it's in, within the range of sort of SCA time period and not mid to late 1800s. Um, did the dress shift colors or did Sargent think other colors were better? I'm betting that it shifted colors because we weren't, we were good at dye at that point, but we weren't like lock it down forever good at dye at that point. Um, I know that that dress has also been sort of extensively conserved. Uh, it's got, it's famous for having beetle wings all over it. And so I know that they've gone back in and like sewn tears up and sewn new beetle wings and so forth on. Um, lighting definitely can affect how we see the colors. So it may be that on stage the dress was a lot darker because they were doing like mood lighting for Lady Macbeth and on this we've got sort of a front a front archival sort of image lighting um conserved yeah <laughs> language sometimes sometimes just gets me um all right so don't trust a pre-raphaelite which someone said in the chat don't trust a victorian which also leads us to dover books i love me some dover books but a lot of the artwork and a lot of the uh engravings from the dover books come from the victorians who wanted to codify everything they wanted to write down everything and be like this is exactly what this is and like here's the box that it fits in so a lot of these engravings a lot of this artwork is from that time period again we're 200 years later they're interpreting from the primary sources, which we'll talk primary, secondary in a second, they're interpreting from the artwork that's still existing. They don't really know how it all goes together. They're making a best guess. If all you want is silhouette, not the worst. If you want details, don't get near them. Um, similarly, uh, there are a series of books called The Mode Inn, which is what that third image of all the women in the hats are. Uh, they are very famous and a lot of costumers, a lot of like professional costumers like them because it's easy to like open to a page and be like, ah, in 1540 we were wearing these. But again, it's a guy who has spent time sort of looking at artwork and going, yeah, I think this is kind of how it goes together. It's not a primary source. So it may not be bad, it may not be the best. Um, I chose that that page specifically because the lower left woman with the sort of rolls and this like pointy thing that comes out the front, I am still hunting down the research on that hat. I have a feeling that may be another saint hat. Because um, you can find a fair number of them, but you never seem to find them on like real people. Um, but he just sort of saw that hat and was like, yep, it's in art. They wore it, so we're going to draw it in here. So don't trust a Dover book. Don't trust a Victorian. Find something that's not the mode in books if you're researching hats. Um, those are sort of my three big, like, don't do this. Uh, and then I think that is, that is the end of the slides, but I have a couple more things to say, so I'll let you sort of just stare at my outro slide. Um, where to start researching and all of this will be i'll drop everyone the link to this document in uh the chat like as we finish so you'll have sort of all of this written down uh where to start researching re researching researching um primary sources are the best so i tell students consider all of your research like a big game of telephone the closer you are to the original source to so the person that said whatever it was first the better your information is going to be. Um, so obviously like original materials, painting, woodcuts, statuary, stained glass, illustrations in the books, all of those um, images that we just sort of went through from the time period and the location that you're interested in are going to be the best. Um, use written and non-art things to sort of confirm what you're seeing in the primaries and the, or in the primary source artwork. Um, 
laws and travel writing and things like that are also sort of primary sources that folks don't think about. Um, but I know there are, I'm, I'm not going to remember his name, but there's a, a Middle Eastern trader that got up into uh, like North Scandinavia and wrote down a lot about like, oh, these people like brush their hair and blacken their eyes and do things like that. And like, here's kind of what they're wearing. Um, similarly, like sumptuary laws will tell you what people wanted to be wearing, even if they weren't allowed to. Um, so it'll tell you sort of what was around then. I've got a flood of input in the chat here. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So folks in there have come up with the trader name. I'm like, I knew he existed, just didn't remember his name. Um, and then a couple requests for stuff. So let me get through, let me get through the very end of this, and I promise we'll go back. Um, so sumptuary laws, look at museum websites. I know I said this before, but like, I'm gonna hit it again. Museums, 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 museums. Um, a lot of the bigger museums have their, a lot of their art collection and a lot of their costume collection online. Um, if you're looking for a specific culture, try to find a museum in that country. Um, we know that, you know, kid, cultural kidnapping by museums is an issue, but a good place, if you're looking at Persian stuff, is a good place to start, you know, somewhere in the, in the Middle East. Start in Iran, see what they've got. Um, the best way to find museum collections, I have found, is Google Arts and Culture. And I've got a link to that in here. Um, but Google Arts and Culture is basically this giant index of so many digitized collections that are on the world. You've got, like, the Hermitage, you've got the V&A, you've got, like, the Louvre, you've got everyone. Um, and you can then, like, Google may only show part of their collection, but then you know that, like, a lot of their stuff is digitized, and you can go to their website and start looking in there. Um, Google Translate with that, also a great friend of yours. Um, so primary sources first, if you can find it, the artwork, the writing, anything like that. Um, secondary sources, okay, not as good. So the secondary source is a source that's not original, but is synthesizing or pulling from the original. So like I was saying, the um, mode in books are someone like looking at a primary source and sort of redrawing it. Um, they're missing a lot of the minutia of the primary source, but sort of if you need to start there, this is sort of secondary sources I usually refer to as sort of the Wikipedia, like get the idea and then figure out the actual details. So because Wik Wikipedia is really good at giving you the sort of like rundown on this thing and then like you have to go do more of the research. Um, one of the last things I wanted to talk about is Pinterest because when folks are doing garb research, Pinterest is always up there. Um, Pinterest is both amazing and crappy at the same time. Um, so a lot of making Pinterest useful to you is learning sort of what's a valid source and what's not. If it's an actual textile from a museum, like the British Museum or the Louvre or something like that, it's a good source. Or if it's artwork from there, it's a great source. Um, if it's art from an actual museum, sometimes on Pinterest, you'll get sort of the pedigree of it in the comments, what so will give you sort of the artist attribution and all of that. Um, sometimes I'll look at that and like go to the museum it claims it's from or like Google like museum name of artwork and see if it will come up um, and go sort of from there. Uh, so that goes back to sort of learning like what do you trust, what do you not trust. Um, other things that show up on Pinterest, if it's blogs showing process photos or research images, a lot of times I'll read those just to see how other people are doing it. Um, or sort of what sources they've found. If it's someone I trust to sort of implicitly, like Edith Miller posts a lot, I think she's master Edith Miller, um, posts a lot on Facebook, or not on Facebook, on, um, well on Facebook too, but on Pinterest, she's got some like really good research sort of Pinterest boards. Uh, Morgan Donner is another SCA person who posts a lot of really good like sort of curated Pinterest boards. Um, so if it's someone that I know, that I see their stuff, and they know they know what they're doing, I tend to trust them without sort of double checking them. Um, if it's photos of people in garb that you're finding, take it as inspiration, do your own research again, unless it's someone like Edith or like uh, Morgan Donner who like knows what they're doing and you know you can trust them. Um, and then I've given you, when I throw this link up, I've given you a couple of other people that like I tend to trust because over time they have sort of shown me like, 
uh, you know what you're seeing. You're not just sort of randomly, you know, like pinning things in boards for the heck of it. Uh, so I've given you another couple of names in here if you want to start like following them to get sort of better curated stuff. Um, one of the other things that Pinterest can be good at, even though it is sort of, you know, a hit or miss, uh, is giving you an opportunity to hone your eye. Like I've said numerous times through this, so much of playing this game is starting to figure out what you're looking at. Uh, so if you go to Pinterest and you type in like Coat Hardy England 1350, uh, and you get, you know, six things that are all the same and then one that's really strange, you can either research that one and be like, is this actually from this era? Or you can look at it and go, ah, these are probably the real thing. This one is the joke. Like this one is the one that doesn't fit. So you play one of these things is not like the other. Um, I think that's basically all I have to say. Let me dig into the uh, chat here and see if anyone else is asking questions. Uh, yes, I'm getting full name on my Arabic trader, which I am not going to try to pronounce again language. Um, good list of museums that have good clothing collections. Uh, my go to my first go to is the V&A, the Victoria and Albert in England. Um, the Kyoto 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 costume collection in Japan in Kyoto, Japan may not get quite this early, but is great for, uh, or may not get quite early enough Western and Western stuff, but we'll have obviously some Japanese things. Um, the British Museum tends to have a lot of good stuff. Uh, I'm trying to remember if the MFA in Boston actually has anything early. I don't think they do. I think they stay within sort of the American time period. Um, the Rikes Museum, I believe, has some real costuming, and they have a lot of, if you're interested in lace, they have a lot of lace, because it's in uh, Amsterdam. Um, so they were sort of in the center of all of the lace making. Uh, the Swedish Historica Museum for the Vikings. Um, there's the, I'm trying to remember, I think it's the Danish Historic Museet, um is also good for some Viking stuff. They have, I think they have the Huldramos Girl, which is the, even like pre-Viking is the rope, the girl in the rope skirt that came out of a bog. Um, not coming up with any more off the top of my head. If anyone else has one, feel free to chime in. Let me back up so in the, oh, nope, there we go. Let me show my, my, my black coated ladies off again, because I know someone had asked for that. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to chime in. Someone did say translation can be an issue on a primary source. It absolutely can be. Um, I have used a lot of Google Translate. I have also turned to friends or friends of friends who speak the language and go, can you give me an idea of what they're saying here? Um, so obviously making friends that speak other languages is a great resource to have. Anyone else? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> to ask you questions unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel free. Um, I see that your name is Norse, and that's one of the main primary um, areas that I research as well. What do you find are your best places to look for garb examples for them? Because I know for the, for the Norse. Office. Yeah. Um, I oh, can I remember her name? Hilda. I want to say it's Hilda Tunum. Um, online. So there are a couple, there's Neela Glacel, who has done a lot of research and has published a couple of books on Viking stuff. So I generally look at Neela Glacel. Um, Hilda Tunum has done a lot of stuff that's online. Um, and she, she is really good at breaking down sort of here's what has been in the, like what we've dug up and sort of how that goes with sort of this other thing that I'm trying. So she'll show you sort of the piece that exists and then sort of how she used that in, in like the garb that she's made. Um, there's, do I have it? I just had a big pile of books here. Um, Thor Ewing is the author of a book called Viking Clothing, which is great because it's a little older, but he goes in and sort of says, these are the like X number of like the big theories on how clothing worked and why like this seems probable and this doesn't. 
because a lot of the Viking work is what do we what do we believe this year? Um, there's uh, if you want to get slightly post Viking, but sort of like in the same vicinity, uh, woven into the earth is textiles from Norse Greenland. Um, but I think most of the stuff that they find, I want to say is later. I want to say it's like post 1100, but they still have like most of the textiles at least, but they still are getting a lot of the textile tools and so forth um, from sort of the actual like Norse, like Norse era there. Um, and woven into the earth is an interesting one because it shows you sort of this weird transition between kind of Norse into like the coat hardy era where everyone else was, but like it took them longer to get there. Um, and a lot of their, their garments have sort of like 17 seams in the underarm for shaping. Um, so that one, that one's fast. Someday I'm going to make one of those just because I want to see how it works. <laughs> it looks rather frightening. Yeah, uh, and people are bringing up, yeah, the medieval clothing reconstructed, or medieval garments reconstructed is sort of the secondary, the sort of associate book with um, Woven into the Earth, where that one actually shows you the pattern. So Woven into the Earth, like, shows you the patterns, and then they're like, this is what it looks like, and here we go. Um, and garments reconstructed is actually like, here's how to sort of, like, use the patterns. And I tried to, on the end of the, let me throw this link for the Google Doc up. I'm going to stop, stop screen sharing for a second. Let me throw the link for this Google Doc up, because I've tried to throw in there um, a series of sort of books that I own and use all the time. So let me throw this link in here and make sure that that, hopefully that will work for everyone. If it doesn't, let me know. And I've bollocked up the URL somehow. <laughs> Anyone else got questions? Happy to keep, I'm basically happy to keep fielding questions as long as people want to ask them. It's always, it's always easier for me to answer questions because then I know like what people want to know than just to stand here and be like, blur information. Yeah, so in the chat we've brought up um, outside Western Europe, there's a tendency to treat wide stretches of time and or areas as all the same. So I know um, I'm real bad at like Persian versus Arabic versus um, Turkish and stuff like that. Like I try, I try to get them right. I am bad at it and I recognize that. Um, and there's a lot of difference. So I know, especially recently, people have been looking at sort of Persian clothing and Turkish clothing and being these and saying these are not the same. Um, here are the differences. Um, so definitely like, uh, like figuring out sort of exactly what you're looking at and exactly where you're looking at gets you very, very far. Um, again, apologies, this was very winter, Western centered because that's sort of where my, where my expertise, where my interest is. Um, but any of the principles that I talked about and like looking for seam lines, looking for closures, looking for stuff like that can be taken and used in non-Western cultures too. Um, you just have to, you just have to look at sort of, if it's not a culture that I am from, how do I get the information on how it goes together instead of looking at it from a Western eye and being like, ah, yes, clearly this is one of these. It's exactly what I would have done. Um, and I think one of the books that I threw in the end of the Google document is, uh, I, IPAC, which is a very like, I, I want, I think it's IPAC. I like, I, I asked for friends for uh, like, what are the best costuming books you have? Um, and they were like, oh, this is the one you want if you're doing Turkish. So I'm trying to expand my horizons. I haven't just, just haven't quite gotten there yet. Any other questions? Last call. <laughs> All right, it sounds like everyone is pretty happy. Um, thank you all for coming.